Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. My name is Martin Kölling, I'm uh, the moderator of today, and it's my great honor to introduce today's guest, uh, Kleist Prestovich, uh, to us. It's a very timely moment with uh, the trade negotiations with China going to end, maybe, and uh, the trade negotiations with Japan going to start <laughs> after that. Um, and uh, I think uh, many older <coughs> active uh, and uh, retired Japanese still carry f more or less fond memories of you <laughs> from the old good old uh, good old days of the last trade war with Japan uh, he was very he was you were involved in that uh, uh, trade war as I think as uh, uh, under President uh, Ronald Reagan, you were uh, uh, Councillor of the Secretary, uh, Secretary of Commerce. Now you are uh, the President of the Economic Strategy Institute, and uh, you are said to have provided the intellectual basis uh, of uh, the current U U.S. trade policies. Um, I also want to uh, Mention your book. Uh, I think that it might be the f uh, the basis of this policy, the betrayal of American prosperity, free market delusions, America's uh, decline, and how we must compete in the post-dollar er era. Please give our guest a warm welcome, and then I open the floor to you. And uh, yeah, oh, please you fill much. us in about your view about the current trade policies and the current state of the discussions. It's uh, a great pleasure to be back at the Foreign Correspondents Club. I have to admit that um, when I was uh, planning this trip, I was pleasantly surprised to receive an email from Itosan uh, asking if I would have time to speak at the FCCJ. And I was very happy to do that because, as you all know, one of the uh, benefits of speaking at FCCJ is that you get a membership for a year. And my membership is almost over. So thank you, I'm back. <laughs> Yesterday I attended a uh, conference uh, put on by uh, General uh, PDO, PNO, uh, PDO, and uh, we were talking all day, I mean all day, from 9 o'clock in the morning until 6 o'clock in the evening uh, about China-U.S. Uh, trade conflict, trade war. Uh, and uh, someone said to me, one of the Japanese attendees said to me, oh, Prestowitz, son, you're so famous. And I said, well, I'm not sure if I'm, uh, if I'm uh, Yume or Akume, uh, uh, infamous. Uh, and... Uh, but I did have the experience of going through the U.S.-Japan Boeki Masatsu uh, of the 1980s. And there are a lot of similarities between that and the current conflict with China. Uh, but there are also great differences. Um, so let me uh, talk about both of those aspects. Um, thinking about similarities, um, there I, I got involved in 1981. I, I, I'm one of those people who went to Washington uh, for a year in 1981, and I have been there for 38 years. Uh, but I went there uh, under, in the Reagan administration uh, as the uh, trade friction with Japan was becoming really very serious. Uh, and. Um, and I noticed as we went through, uh, we, we, we had constant flow of complaints from American companies, and not just American companies, but European companies as well, that they were just having so much trouble in Japan. Uh, and they would come, there was a pattern. They, the companies would come into the Commerce Department, and they would say, oh, these Japanese, they're, they're not playing fair. Um, and uh, they uh, put all kinds of obstacles uh, in our way, and uh, there are all kinds of unseen barriers. And so we, the negotiators, would come to Japan, and we would say to our Japanese counterparts at, uh, at Miti, then it was Miti, Tsusancho, and uh, of course, Okurasho, the Ministry of Finance, and of course, uh, uh, Gaimusho. And, um, 
we would say to the Japanese officials, listen, uh, you have to stop acting this way. It's not fair, and uh, you're a member of, in those days we didn't have the WTO, we had what we called the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariff and Trade. You're a member of the GATT. Um, you tell us that you are a democracy, that you are a free market capitalist economy, but it seems like um, you're throwing uh, barriers in the face of, uh, of uh, foreign commerce. And the Japanese officials would say to us, <laughs> What are you talking about? Uh, the problem is not, our market is more open than yours. Our tariffs are lower than yours, and they were. Uh, and the problem is that your businessmen aren't trying hard enough. Their delivery is always late. Their quality is poor. For pity's sake, they put the steering wheel on the wrong side of the car. How do you expect to sell anything in Japan? And this occurred, it could, be, it could be walnuts, it could be rice, it could be telecommunications, semiconductors, machine tools, automobiles, time and time again. We went through the same pattern. And, and finally, I, I began to think uh, that maybe we were victims of false assumptions. And what I meant by that is that we, the assumption of our negotiation was essentially that we were playing the same game. Uh, let's say we assumed that we were all playing tennis. Uh, and, uh, and we assumed that because um, we had this um, view that the Japanese, Japan is a democracy just like the US. Uh, and it's a market economy like the US, like the EU. But then I began to think, wait a minute. Yes, Japan is a democracy, but up to that point, only one party had ever ruled Japan. Yes, Japan is a democracy, but the bureaucrats uh, in Japan are very powerful. In fact, in fact, Whereas in the United States, every mother wants her son to, uh, to go to Harvard Business School and, and become another Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates and, and make a fortune. In Japan, every mother wants her son to be, to be a bureaucrat at Susansho or a Gaimosho uh, because it's a high status uh, uh, kind of thing. So the, and, and the, Bureaucrats have, they, they have what they call gyose shido, the administrative guidance. So that, uh, in fact, I remember even uh, Akio Morita, founder of uh, Sony, once said to me about a certain problem. He said, so Sancho must give them strong guidance. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. The Secretary of Commerce in the United States cannot give strong guidance to an American company. He doesn't have the power. But in Japan, he had the power. Uh, so the relationship of government to industry in Japan was quite different from that in the US. Uh, and, uh, and then secondly, um, the... Um, the concept of, uh, of um, the way that Japan played, played uh, market economics. So uh, yes, Japan was a market economy, but uh, there, were, they, uh, there was large keiretsu um, uh, with interlocking shareholdings. So, uh, about 75% of the shares listed on the Tokyo Stock Exchange never changed. They were cross-held. Uh, and so the relationship between suppliers and producers and, and between distributors and, and uh, retailers, very strong relationship, uh, very hard to break into. Uh, or think about automobiles. Uh, in the US, an automo in order to sell automobiles, uh, if you're an automobile producer, you have to have dealers. The dealer is the one who sells to the driver. Uh, and, um, 
And in the U.S., the dealer is, by law, uh, considered to be independent from the producer. So, um, in fact, I recently, I, I own an Infiniti uh, QX50, and uh, I had to take it back to the dealer for some service recently. And so I went to the dealer, uh, Jim Coleman uh, Infiniti. But just across the street is Jim Coleman Cadillac. And uh, on the other street is Jim Coleman Mercedes. So Jim Coleman sells all of them. Uh, well, in Japan, Mercedes dealer sells Mercedes. He doesn't sell Cadillac. He doesn't sell Infiniti. Um, so if you're an auto producer and you want to get into the US market, you already have a dealer network made for you. You just go to Jim Coleman and make him a good offer, and he'll sell your car. But in Japan, if you go to Jim Coleman Toyota, he won't sell your Infiniti, he won't sell your Mercedes, he won't, you, you have to have a separate dealer. And creating a new dealer, a network, is expensive, really expensive. Particularly in a place like Japan with very high land costs. So, so actually the ability to crack the market in the auto market is, is much easier in the US than it is in Japan. The same is true in Korea, the same is true in Germany. It's, it's not just the Japanese phenomenon, but, but anyhow, you, you can see the difference. So I said, you know what? We are not all playing tennis. We, the US, are playing tennis, but in Japan, they're playing American football. And, uh, and they're playing, maybe they're playing the game fairly. Uh, they're not going offside, they're not roughing the passer. But foot, they have helmets, and they have pads, uh, and football is a rougher game than tennis. Um, and so we began to negotiate with maybe a clearer understanding of the differences between the two sides. So anyhow, the main point is that we did reach agreements. Uh, we did resolve a lot of trade friction. Um, uh, U.S. and Japan, of course, were and are allies. Uh, and w did in those days and do today uh, support each other in a wide variety of international objectives. Um, at one point, um, the Japanese press uh, and many of the Japanese newspapers described me as Nihon ni tote ichiban kiken na jinbutsu. And um, they don't do that anymore. Um, uh, I think my reputation has been a little bit improved uh, over the years. Um, but um, when I then turned to China, and I have been in over the last uh, four years, I have been uh, writing about and visiting, and uh, I, I haven't been negotiating with China, but I I have been very close to the U.S. negotiators, Bob Lighthizer, a longtime friend of mine. Uh, and as I've studied the Chinese uh, economy, I realize that there are many similarities. Uh, like Japan, China has a catch-up strategy. Uh, it wants to catch up to the leading industrialized countries, the EU, the U.S., Japan. Uh, it particularly wants to catch up in technology, and it's making a strong effort to become a leader in uh, artificial intelligence and in cyber technology and biotechnology and so forth. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, and it has it has uh, ten year plans and five year plans. Uh, it has an industrial policy. It has it's it's. Uh, strongest industrial policy is what it calls Made in China 2025. Uh, and so uh, the, the policy statement um, aims for China to be making 75% of the uh, content of a variety of advanced industrial products in China by, 20, by the year 2025. Uh, and to that end, uh, the government 
supports, subsidizes, uh, assists in many various ways the Chinese companies to reach those goals. Now, um, that automatically means that China does not want the, the foreign companies uh, like Intel or Google uh, um, and others uh, that are currently leaders in those technologies, China does not want them <laughs> to have a large share of the Chinese market. Uh, and so uh, in various ways, uh, China, the Chinese government operates to obstruct uh, foreign uh, companies in China. So foreign companies that want to operate in China are under a lot of pressure to have joint ventures. They're under a lot of pressure to transfer technology. Um, and they are under pressure to uh, accept and, and act according to a wide variety of of uh, guidance and pressure that they don't face uh, in the Japanese market or in the EU market or in the US market. Uh, and, and so the companies come to the governments, uh, the EU commission, the uh, US trade representative, um, and I'm sure Japanese companies are complaining to uh, uh, Meti and, and to the Gaimu show uh, and Okoro show. Um, and, um, but there's an interesting phenomenon here um, which I can best explain with a personal example. Um, some years ago, I was on the board of directors of Intel, the, uh, the big semiconductor producer. And Andy Grove um, <coughs> was uh, the CEO. Andy invited me <coughs> to make a trip to China with him. Uh, and because Intel is an important company, because Andy Grove is a very well-known person, uh, we had good entree. Uh, into the Chinese uh, government. We, we met with, uh, with Hu Jintao, and we met with many of the regional leaders. And as we made our different visits, I realized that uh, there were certain words and certain uh, issues that kept being articulated by the Chinese. At every meeting, at some point, one of the Chinese would say, Mr. Grove, when are you going to put a semiconductor factory in China? Uh, and then they would say, don't you realize that you must maintain a high image in China? And I kept hearing that, and I kept wondering, what do they mean, high image? What, what are they talking about? And so I asked some of my Chinese friends, and they said, well, Clyde, it's, it's like this. Um, they're trying to tell you in a nice way that uh, if you don't put a factory in China, bad things can happen to you. Uh, for example, your products might be somehow delayed in, in delivery into, to your customer in China. Now, they won't, there won't be a government uh, uh, letter to you telling you to delay your delivery, but something will happen along the way, and your products won't get to the right place at the right time. Uh, or you might find some of your key employees are leaving, uh, some of the people you rely on to run your Chinese business. You might find that they leave the company. And uh, you won't ever know exactly why. It, it's the death of a thousand cuts, because there are because the government is so powerful. They can, in many informal ways, they can give gyosei shido uh, uh, and uh, negative gyosei shido. Uh, on the other hand, at every stop along the way, the Chinese would say, "Well." How much does a 
semiconductor factory cost? Eight billion dollars. Oh, well, let's see. We could give you the land free. We could provide utilities at half cost. No taxes for 25 years. We could even make a billion dollar uh, capital grant. Uh, what do you think? Well, actually, if you're a semiconductor producer and you're looking at an $8 billion investment, but you get the land free, you get a billion dollar investment, you get utilities at half cost, no taxes for 25 years, and you do your discounted cash flow, do your financial analysis, that looks pretty good. So here's a funny thing. <clears throat> When we all studied economics uh, at university, we were all told that, uh, that trade, international trade, is win-win. And we were told that, uh, that uh, companies, countries would trade products in which they have a comparative advantage. Uh, and, um, and then they would buy products in which they did not have a comparative advantage. So if you look at the United States in, uh, let's say, uh, 2005, and you said, what products, in what products does the United States have a comparative advantage? Certainly semiconductors. Certainly semiconductors. U.S. had a large trade surplus in semiconductors. Intel was and is, remains, the low-cost producer of semiconductors. Uh, semiconductors are not labor-intensive. There's hardly any labor in a semiconductor. It's all capital and technology. And China has no advantage, no, no natural advantage in making semiconductors. Uh, the advantage lies with Intel. But if you do a financial analysis and compare putting an $8 billion factory in America and putting an $8 billion factory in China, and in America you don't get the land free, you don't get, no, you don't get utilities at half cost, you don't get a billion dollar capital grant, and you don't get no taxes for 25 years. So do your discounted cash flow in the US and look at the same thing in China, and China wins. Uh, and so with that kind of industrial policy, China uh, is able, and Intel did, in fact, put a factory in China. Uh, and so we see that same phenomenon taking place in aviation and medical equipment and all kinds of things across the board. And of course, that results in conflict, economic conflict, uh, and, and eventually in these trade discussions. Now, um, people yesterday kept asking me why, why was there this sudden change in American policy? Uh, they, made, they, they, are, they said, and, and they are largely correct, that for the past, uh, let's say, past uh, 30 years, certainly the past 20 years, the United States has been uh, um, <clears throat> working with and, and, uh, and seeming to uh, be integrating its economy with China. And now the U.S. under Trump uh, is, seems to be reversing its course. Uh, why the sudden change? Uh, what happened? And the answer is that it's not just the United States. Um, in fact, <clears throat> the, the first, I would say, the, uh, maybe the most important uh, statement of change occurred uh, on the 1st of March last year, uh, 2018. Uh, the Economist magazine, <clears throat> which as you all know, is, has long been a champion of free trade, champion of globalization, um, the Economist cover story. Uh, the title of the cover story was The West Made the Wrong Bet. What did they talking about? Well, they were talking about that in 2001, 2002, the 
free market democratic countries, the EU, the US, Japan, Australia, uh, accepted that China should join the WTO. Uh, and many leaders around the world uh, accepted the idea that China was, uh, was uh, liberalizing its economy and that globalization would not only liberalize the Chinese economy, but would also liberalize Chinese politics. And maybe China wouldn't immediately become a democracy, but it would become more democratic, uh, more politically open as well as economically open. And some of you may remember New York Times uh, 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 editorial writer uh, Tom Friedman wrote a book saying the world is flat, uh, meaning there are no barriers. You can sell in China, India, US, EU, all the same. Uh, Francis Fukuyama, a well-known American scholar, wrote a book called The End of History. Uh, at the end of the Cold War, it seemed that democracy and market economics was generally accepted globally as the right way to run a country. Uh, and so we were at the end of history. Um, yeah. And um, so um, Bill Clinton made the comment that uh, globalization is Americanization. Bob Zellick, former head of the World Bank, made the comment that we want China to be a responsible stakeholder in the global system. And so there was this great effort to, to integrate China into the global system. And what the economists said in March a year ago was, it's not working. Uh, that was followed by other articles by leading people like Kurt Camel, the former Assistant Secretary of State, who said, yeah, it's not working. Uh, and that, I think, was a moment of great reverse which has led to, of course, we have a new president, President Trump, who uh, is uh, um, not very diplomatic uh, uh, in his approach. Uh, but it wasn't Trump who made the first statement here. It was The Economist. And normally, The Economist is critical of Trump. But in this case, Trump read The Economist and said, gee, they're right. Let's do something. Uh, and so here we are in negotiation with China. We don't yet know if there will be an agreement. But let me say as a closing comment that even if there is an agreement, it won't be the end of the, of, of the problem. Uh, the problem, in my view, is a fundamental clash of systems and values, which will continue for quite some time. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, and uh, then I will open the floor to questions. Yes, please. Uh, Isabel Reynolds from Bloomberg. Thanks very much for your talk. Um, I wondered if we could, um, going back to your experiences in the early 90s, could we go back to US-Japan uh, relations? How do you see the situation now compared in that relationship compared with the, when you were dealing with it? And what do you expect to be the result of the trade talks that are coming up? With Japan? Yes. Yeah. Well, I think Japan today is a very different place from Japan in 1980. Um, I think that, uh, of course, Japan has gone through one of the, class, one of the, one of the history's great bubbles uh, and still bears scars uh, from that experience. The uh, I would say that the, there have been uh, significant, maybe fundamental changes. So the, the ability, the power of bureaucrats in Japan today in terms of Gyosei Shido is much less than it was in the 1980s. Uh, the, um, uh, the Japanese economy is a much more open economy today than it was then. Uh, and um, 
if you look at the trading of shares on the Tokyo Exchange, uh, it's a much bigger percentage of the shares are traded. Um, and uh, it's possible to acquire a Japanese company, a foreign company can acquire a Japanese company. Uh, and so I think it's a much more open economy. Um, you know, it still, <clears throat> it still has um, the characteristics, uh, structural characteristics, and the, the automobile industry still in Japan. The you, Toyota dealers sell Toyotas, and Nissan dealers sell Nissans. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it's it's basically, I think it's a much easier place to do business than it was in the 1970s <clears throat> or 1980s. Um, Japan has suffered. I mean, in the 1980s, the Japanese semiconductor industry was very powerful. Um, unfortunately, uh, I think for Japan, uh, it almost doesn't have a semiconductor industry. The, the major semiconductor companies today are American, Korean, and, and Taiwanese. Um, uh, and the same is true in other, um, if you think of, of uh, Keitai, cell phones. Uh, and all the major producers are American and, and Korean and Chinese. Um, and uh, so Japan has taken, I think, some bad losses in technology development. Uh, be, and I think partly because Japan hasn't had the strong government support <clears throat> that it had in the 70s and 80s, and partly because uh, Japanese industry has uh, for a variety of reasons, not been as aggressive uh, as the Chinese, as the Chinese and the Koreans. Uh, so I think that there's a lot of room for um, for rethinking of Japanese policy. Now, if I look at trade negotiations between the U.S. and and Japan, let's say coming up, um, I have to be honest and say I'm a bit I'm a bit concerned. Um, I think that we, again, we come back to uh, structural differences. Um, Japan continues, to, of course, to have a substantial uh, trade surplus with the U.S., and the Trump administration doesn't like uh, big trade surpluses or deficits, and so that will be a target. Uh, and um, and there will be, uh, be because Japan has persevered with the TPP 11 uh, after the U.S. dropped out. Japan will be reluctant, I think, to make many concessions to the U.S. because it already has made deals in the TPP 11, and it made those deals when it thought the U.S. was going to be part of the TPP, and so. I, I think it, I understand why Japan might be reluctant to make further concessions to the U.S. and certainly cannot make concessions to the U.S. that it hasn't made to the TPP partners. Um, I think that uh, automobiles is likely to be an issue. Um, and um, in that regard, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not sure in my own mind um, you know, what a good solution could be. Um, one thing that, that puzzles me is that Japan is not any longer a low-cost location for auto production. Um, uh, labor is not cheap in Japan, uh, and, and capital is not less expensive in Japan than it is anywhere else. Japan has... Uh, um, uh, excess capacity. I mean, Japan has can capacity for about 13 million vehicles, and it only sells in Japan about three and a half or four million. Uh, and even when you count exports, still has three or four million vehicles worth of excess capacity. Uh, and so, um, I think it's a difficult, going to be a difficult negotiation. I wish I had a, a more uh, optimistic. Uh, outlook, but I just think it's going to be a difficult negotiation.
Süddeutsche Zeitung, Christoph Neidert. You've been locating all the problems now in the 1980s, 90s on Japan and now on China. <laughs> and, uh, but the US has become a, a, a exporter of soybeans and, uh, and, and beef. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the quality of the United States in the industry has gone, I mean, no American wants to buy an American car anymore. <laughs> so, isn't, and then, then on top of all that, uh, you think, you, you think with Bill Clinton, globalization should be Americanization. Aren't you, aren't you only looking backwards? And uh, as an, uh, one word to China, I mean, China is not a democracy, but it's pluralistic. Even under Xi Jinping, it's a pluralistic society. So it's not been comparable to what it was 20 or 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Good points, good points. Um, yeah, I think that on the one hand, <coughs> it's certainly true that uh, the uh, the mix of uh, U.S. Uh, economic production and the mix of, of exports uh, has certainly shifted, and it has shifted to a lower value added uh, uh, in a way. Uh, there has been enormous offshoring of U.S. production. So Apple uh, doesn't make anything in the U.S. It, it designs and, and, uh, and, and markets in the U.S., but its production is in China and, and, and Vietnam. Uh, and um, yeah, I think that uh, the U.S. could benefit from uh, adopting some of the Chinese and, uh, and former Japanese policies. I, th I personally uh, am promoting an industrial policy for the United States. Uh, and, um, uh, but having said that, <clears throat> uh, there are two um, uh, other points. One is that when you say China is a pluralistic society, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Um, I mean, I'm looking at Xinjiang province in China where four million Uyghurs are being put in concentration camps. That doesn't seem to me to be pluralistic. It seems to me the Han Chinese are, as they did in Tibet, are trying to erase the Uyghurs. Uh, and so I'm not sure what you mean by pluralistic. I don't see China as pluralistic. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, I, I often hear people uh, compare Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, with uh, Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba. Uh, and they both certainly are very successful entrepreneurs, and they share a lot of charisma and, and characteristics. But... Uh, you may recall a f few years ago that a Chinese billionaire one night just disappeared, just disappeared into thin air from the Four Seasons Hotel in Hong Kong. I was in the hotel that night. I called my wife. I said, they missed me. Uh, but Jack Ma can disappear. Jeff Bezos is not going to disappear. So when we talk about Chinese private companies or state-owned enterprises. Okay, the Chinese do have private companies and state-owned enterprises, but no significant Chinese private company can defy or ignore or go against the wishes of the Communist Party and the Chinese government. And so in a sense, all of the Chinese companies are state-owned or state-guided enterprises. And that certainly is not true in Japan or Europe or in the United States. Um, and while I believe, personally, that the United States would benefit from an industrial policy a la China, that would also mean that the U.S. would be violating many of the WTO uh, demands and agreements. So that would suggest that we need to throw away the WTO. Now, I personally believe the WTO badly, badly needs uh, reform. Uh, but you can imagine, <laughs> I mean, we went through the Doha round, which was extremely difficult and not successful. And so uh, any new round like that is fraught with difficulty. So, but I do appreciate your question, and I understand your point. And I, it's certainly true that uh, the problem doesn't lie entirely outside the United States. Uh, we have lots of problems in the United States. <laughs> Let me just say that I think the chances are good that we won't have a President Trump in a couple of years. <laughs>
Tokumoto Freelance for Japanese uh, Weekly Magazine. Uh, thank you for press conference today. Um, as you may know, Japanese Emperor Akihito will abdicate next month, yes. marking the end of imperial Heisei era yeah. of yeah. post-war Japan. Yeah. Um, um, my question is, uh, looking back your experience on trade talks with Japan mm. since 1980s, do you remember any example that the Japanese monarchy exercised any influence on the trade mm. talk mm. between Japan and the United States? Mm. Mm. I'm, I'm asking this question because when I did an investigation into the uh, memoir and declassified Japanese document, right. I could confirm Japanese uh, Emperor Hirohito, yeah. he was very much interested in mm. international affairs, right. including the trade issues, yeah. and he was trying to get his message across yes. outside the government channel. Yeah. Interesting question. Um, so um, it so happened <clears throat> that in the university, um, I made a friend, a Japanese friend, who eventually became, uh, he, he worked first in the Gaimu Show, but eventually became Chamberlain for the emperor. And I do remember at one point we were having great, we were at the peak of the Masatsu, the great friction. I do remember uh, having dinner with my friend one night uh, and uh, just explaining to him the, the US uh, point of view. Uh, and, and I did that because I thought that he still had influence at the Gaimo show. But it's very possible <laughs> that he also had influence with the emperor. <laughs> I don't really know. Uh, it's a good question. <laughs> Interesting question. <clears throat> yes, please. Uh, my name is Mayumi Watanabe. Uh, I'm from Platts, uh, focused on um, resources. Uh, when you say the crash of the two systems, China and the US, uh, and, and the talks are going on, what would be the um, well worst case scenario, best case scenario? Uh, would the uh, China uh, tariff on US products rise to you know 50%, 75%? Do you see that happening? OK. Let me say, I don't see this as a clash just between the US and China. Uh, I see that the EU and Japan and all of the free market democratic countries uh, are facing the same issue with Japan. The, uh, the uh, Federation of German Industry has just issued maybe the strongest paper I've seen uh, with regard to the problem of dealing with China. Um, Germany has imposed, as you probably know, uh, greater restrictions on Chinese investment in German companies. So this is not just a US-China uh, thing. Uh, now, I think that um, it's very hard to know what the results will be because no one, no one, believe me, no one, uh, not even in the White House, uh, knows uh, what Donald Trump is going to do from one moment to the next. I mean, he just went to Hanoi to speak with Kim Jong-un, and uh, most people expected some kind of an agreement. But there was no agreement, and he, he walked away. So I hesitate to forecast what might happen in a U.S.-China negotiation. But let's say I think that it's not impossible that there would be a further uh, uh, increase in U.S. tariffs uh, against China. Uh, and I think that, but ev even if there are not, I think that what this current conflict has done is to make uh, businesses, not just American businesses, but but essentially all free market businesses uh, a, a little more careful um, about their investment in China. 
So even without further tariffs, you're already seeing that companies are beginning to move some of their production from China to Vietnam or to India or to Malaysia um, because they're beginning to feel like there's a risk, there may be more risk in investing in China. So if the tariffs are raised further, I think that effect would be stronger and you would see a greater move of production out of China and into other countries. Uh, but I think that, <clears throat> I think an important element to understand is that even if that doesn't happen, even if there are no tariffs, because the Chinese policy is to make things in China <laughs> by Chinese companies, there will inevitably be a reduction of the uh, the role of uh, foreign capital and foreign technology and foreign companies in the Chinese economy. Uh, and there will be increasing uh, Chinese exportation and Chinese investment, as we're already seeing with the uh, Belt and Road uh, uh, strategy. China is buying ports all over the world and, and is investing in high-speed rail infrastructure around the world. Uh, in ways that expand the role of Chinese companies uh, and reduce the share of the, of the uh, market of the foreign companies. This piece. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Kenji Kawase from Nikkei. I have two questions. I want to follow up on the, the China thing. One is about, uh, from the perspective, not from Japan or United States or Europe, but a much smaller country. You mentioned a bit right now about Belt and Road Initiative. The, the destinations are Southeast Asia or Central Asia, much weaker states mm -hmm. uh, as an individual. And they are facing China day by day. And uh, they don't really have a strong voice like the U.S. Mm -hmm. or how would they, for instance, Southeast Asia, we're closer here to ASEAN, like Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, mm -hmm. Myanmar, those kind of Thailand. How do, what do you think they, how they should deal with, with China? They're coming in in many different forms, right. um, including uh, a lot of uh, tourists or people right. at the same time. That's my first question. I have a second one, sorry. But you talked about Jack Ma in comparison with Jeff Bezos. When Jack Ma decided to step down right. as chairman right. all of a sudden last year, right. uh, from your perspective, why did he do that? Right. Um, could you tell me your take of why Jack Ma, mm -hmm. being so young as, uh, mm -hmm. as an entrepreneur, he, he's stepping out? Mm -hmm. Why is that? Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, good questions. Let me take the last one first. I don't really know <clears throat> why Jack Ma stepped down. Um, I think he explained that he had family reasons. He wanted to spend more time with his family, uh, something like that. Uh, so I don't really know. But I, 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 I was told by a, a Chinese friend that Jack Ma was getting too much publicity uh, and, and that uh, there was concern that he was getting too, you know, he was getting too much of becoming too much of a of a hero uh, in China, uh, and that um, he needed needed to lower his profile. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not. I just was told that. <clears throat> um, but with regard to Southeast Asia, um, I think that <clears throat> they are they, these countries are in. Depend, it depends. I mean, you can look at it from one point of view. You can say, well, they're very lucky. Um, uh, I mean, I was in Singapore. I'm going to go to Singapore tonight. I was, was in Singapore last month. Uh, and um, Singapore economy is booming. Uh, a, a big reason for that is they're getting a lot of Chinese tourists. And they're getting a lot of Chinese students. So they're, one official in Singapore told me that China's biggest export is tourism. Uh, or that Singapore's biggest export is tourism. And the second biggest export is education. And that's all due to China. So Singapore is making money. It's a rich country. GDP, uh, GDP per capita is much higher than in the US. Um, and so you could say they're very lucky. But uh, at the same time, um, one of the Singapore officials said to me that 
they also are nervous uh, because they realize that they, they've already seen the example uh, with regard to Korea that when China gets upset with a country, suddenly the, <laughs> the sales of that country drop. Uh, the, the land on which the U.S. anti-missile installation is located is land owned by Latte. And suddenly Latte was selling nothing in China. <laughs> <laughs> and so they said to me, you know, we understand that if China wanted to stop the tourists from coming, it could. Uh, and, and so they're nervous about that kind of thing. And I think that's true uh, throughout uh, Southeast Asia and, and even into uh, other countries in the region. Uh, and <clears throat> I think that... Um, I think what's beginning to occur, again triggered by the Economist article last year, is a bit of rethinking. Many countries are rethinking about the, let's say, the risk-reward uh, formula in dealing with China. Uh, and each country will have its own uh, solution to that equation, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's an equation that many countries are thinking about. I mean, just <clears throat> in this conference I was, <clears throat> I was at yesterday, uh, many people s were saying that, you know, they don't want to have to, the question was, that as between the U.S. and China, uh, of course, uh, many countries in this region are either formally or informally allied with the U.S. At the same time, they're doing a lot of business with China. And so they're saying, we don't want to make a choice. Don't force us to make a choice between the U.S. and China. Uh, and I understand that. I, I, I understand the position that they're in. My response to them is, but uh, you have to think very carefully uh, whether you ultimately can avoid making a choice. Uh, and every country will have to decide that itself. <clears throat> okay, one question from my side. Uh, we were talking about trade a lot today, uh, but there's also a huge strategic geopolitical uh, political, um, yeah, clash between the uh, United States and China. How does uh, this uh, yeah, clash basically influence trade policies? This was very different. This is one of the big difference to Japan, to yeah. the trade war right. with Japan, yeah. right? Yeah. So how will this play out in the future right. and how is it impacting <coughs> the discussions now? Right. Well, that's a really good question. And <clears throat> again, I want to say that this is not just a strategic clash between the U.S. and China. It's also a clash between Japan and China. I mean, just yesterday I picked up the newspaper at the Okura and I see that four Chinese ships have entered Senkaku waters. Uh, and uh, the uh, air identification zone that China announced, that doesn't affect the U.S. very much. It affects Japan a lot. Um, so I want to emphasize, it's not just the U.S. and China. <clears throat> um, but you're quite right. In the U.S., Japan negotiation, we were strategic partners. At the end of the day, uh, we more or less had to come to a mutual agreement, whereas in the case of China, it's much different. Um, and therefore, <clears throat> I think that the trade negotiation with China uh, between the U.S., but not just the U.S., between the, f the democratic countries, the free market countries, and ch China, inevitably has strategic elements. Uh, when, you have that, when you have a trade negotiation in that context, it is also a strategic negotiation. You, you can't separate the two. Uh, and, um, and so when you make your economic choices, that has to be conditioned also by your strategic choices. And whereas if you didn't have a strategic consideration, you might make one kind of economic choice. When you do have strategic considerations, you might change the economic choice that you make. And I think that's a very important aspect of the discussion. Uh, I mean, I think this whole it, the debate about Huawei and 5G, you know, that clearly is not just 
a trade or economic debate. That clearly is a strategic debate as well as a trade and economic debate. <coughs> Another question? Yeah, okay, please. Yes, it's okay. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Associate Member, Mike, Michael Brook. Um, you referenced uh, a fundamental clash of systems and values vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, China and primarily, I think, the US, but as you suggest, it's not a, a purely bilateral issue, um, as I understand it. Um, if you were to um, list in order of seriousness the three fundamental systems and values of China that are for want of a better word, dangerous for the future. Mm. What would they be and, and why would you select those three? Okay. Thank you. So, you know, I, I, don't want to, uh, I don't want to sound like a broken record, <laughs> but I don't think that the values of the United States are unique. I think that the United States shares the same values as, as Europe and as Japan. So I don't see it as a clash between U.S. and Chinese values. It's a clash between democratic free market values and, and uh, what does Chinese say? They are uh, socialism with uh, Chinese characteristics. <coughs> so what are the, what are the clashes? Um, well, <coughs> we know that Google, you go to China, you go to China, you know you can't get Google uh, if, you, if you go on your computer. Why not? Well, because there's control of information in China. You can get Google here in Tokyo. You can get Google in, uh, in Brussels or Berlin. Uh, so I think that's a fundamental uh, element. Uh, I think that um, <clears throat> the, uh, let's take the Dalai Lama. He often, uh, in the past, he was often invited to speak at universities in the United States, in Europe. I don't know if he spoke, I'm sure, I'm sure he's spoken here in Japan. Um, if you just become conscious, and look, look in the newspaper for invitations to the Dalai Lama. He doesn't get them much anymore. Uh, and, um, uh, and the reason, one reason is because, <clears throat> Uh, at least this is true in the United States. I think it's true elsewhere as well. Um, these universities have a lot of Chinese students, and the Chinese students are paying full full tuition. Uh, the universities want the Chinese students. Um, if they have the Dalai Lama coming to campus, there's a reaction. Uh, they risk a reaction from China, uh, and so there's there's a linkage in dealing with China. There's a linkage that doesn't exist, that, you know, when we were having a trade friction with Japan, there was never any spillover that uh, U.S. Uh, universities would avoid uh, inviting Japanese speakers or vice versa. Uh, the, the trade friction was significant, but it wasn't in the context of changing of values. And, you know, and then you ask for three things. So I think a third thing is that um, uh, when you are dealing with a um, <coughs> excuse me, with a Chinese company, uh, and uh, you're you know negotiating um, some kind of an agreement. I mean, clearly, state-owned companies uh, are very significant in China and actually have been growing in importance uh, under Xi Jinping. Uh, but as I said earlier, even non-state-owned companies, uh, the Communist Party cells are in the companies. They have Communist Party members on their boards. Um, and so they're not completely independent. Uh, and and, and um, they they receive guidance, uh, and and uh, you know, Western European, U.S., even Japanese companies they don't get guidance anymore. Um, so it's a very, in my view, just a very different uh, approach. It, it's socialism with Chinese characteristics, and that is quite different from uh, capitalism and democracy. Uh, with liberal characteristics. <clears throat>
Thank you very much. I'm afraid we have to come to a close today because we have another press conference at one o'clock uh, and we have to refurbish the room a little bit. But thank you very much thank for you. your thank you. presentation. And as it is custom in our club, as you know, you're here to collect your one year on right. membership. <laughs> I just got it delivered. So thank you very much. And I also wanted to mention that we have one book of Mr. Prestowitz here at the uh, out at our library. Beautiful. <laughs> Japan Restored, how Japan can reinvent itself and why this is important for America and the world. Yeah, Let thank me you. Let preview the book one minute. Okay. okay. <laughs> because the first chapter of this book is uh, Tokyo 2050. And you're just, you're, you're visiting Japan after a long absence. You're just arriving over Haneda after a two and a half hour flight from Washington, D.C. in the new Mitsubishi 808 <laughs> supersonic jet liner, right? And Japan is just fantastic. Students around the world don't want to go to second rate places like Harvard or Stanford. They want to go to Todai and Keio. <laughs> Sick people around the world don't want to go to second-rate places like the Mayo Clinic. They want to go to the Meguro Clinic. So Japan has just resurrected itself. So please read the book. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes.